The public inquiry into the Emergencies Act continues in our nation's capital. Over the next six weeks, around 65 people will be giving their testimonies. Political reporter Brian Lilly has been following the inquiry quite closely and joins us now from Toronto. Brian, you say the inquiry has already turned into a blame game with people and organizations working hard to ensure that they're not responsible for what happened earlier this year? Yeah, look, inquiries, public inquiries, they always say that it's not about assigning blame. This is about finding out facts, getting to the bottom of it. Well, no, everyone's trying to point fingers and claim, well, it's this person's fault, it's that person's fault. Um, Ottawa city manager, the top bureaucrat for the municipal government in Ottawa, was up on the stand Monday, Steve Kanellakos. He, he's a man with uh, immense experience in dealing with big protests and dealing with running the, the apparatus that is the um, the city government in the nation's capital. He was blaming the police. And then lawyers for the Ottawa Police Service get up and try and deflect the blame somewhere else. Lawyer for former Ottawa Police Chief Peter Slowly trying to deflect, deflect elsewhere. Um, Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson on the stand trying to blame Doug Ford, uh, the Ontario Premier, um, trying to push blame everywhere but where it belongs. I've said from the beginning, I said it back in January, I said it in February, this was a failure. The way this protest played out um, was a failure of local policing and local city administration. There is no way that all those trucks should have been allowed to get up on Parliament Hill. You absolutely have your right to protest, but you don't have a right to park your truck indefinitely in front of Parliament. But they allowed them to not only get in there, but to harden their stance so that they couldn't just say, OK, it's time to move on. And, and that was a failure of local police who didn't have a clue what was coming or how to handle it. Now, let's circle back to Ottawa Mayor Jim Watson for just a moment here, Brian. He said at one point the Freedom Convoy was started over provincial mask mandates. Brian, it was so much more than that for those who protested. Well, the, the main impetus was the, the federal vaccine mandate. Uh, it was in particular, the connection with truckers was because they brought in a federal mandate that you had to be vaccinated to cross. And truckers who had been exempt from that, it, it was coming into effect that they would no longer be exempt. Now, the problem is, if Justin Trudeau had dropped that immediately, it still wouldn't have meant that Canadian truckers who were unvaccinated could have crossed the border because the Americans had the same policy in effect. So they could have come into Canada, but you couldn't have crossed into the United States, let's say. But that was the impetus. It was the federal vaccine mandates. Yes, there was a bunch of other things added on top, but Jim Watson saying this was about provincial mask mandates and the first couple of minutes of his testimony shows that either he didn't know what's going on or, again, he's trying to put blame elsewhere. My money's on the latter because I've known Jim Watson for more than 20 years. We actually worked together in the media a very long time ago. He's not a dumb man. That was an attempt to deflect blame onto his preferred target, which is Ontario, the Ontario government and Premier Doug Ford, rather than owning the fact that he and his city administration and his police chief weren't ready. Brian, whether it was the mayor or city officials, everyone was quite surprised that the Freedom Convoy stayed a lot longer than just a few days. I mean, with Bridge City News, we were there for well over a month uh, taking part and we're watching some of the people, the bouncy castles and the barbecues and it seemed like people had a really good time there. Were city officials not really paying attention to the messages being delivered by our truckers and others who participated and protested? No, they weren't. They obviously weren't. Or they, they ignored it uh, when they got information that ran counter to what they wanted to believe. So uh, there were briefings um, a few days before the convoy showed up where the Ottawa Police Service was telling them, uh, telling city officials, yeah, there'll be one or 2,000 people and they'll stay for the weekend, but you know, some will stay a little bit longer, but they'll be gone by next Wednesday at the latest. That's not what happened. And if you just listen to them, all you had to do was turn on the TV, listen to the radio, read a newspaper, go on social media, check out Facebook, go on Telegram. The message was consistent. I mean, how many of us did interviews with people who were part of the convoy? And of course, as the convoy is going across the country, the GoFundMe page was taking off and millions and millions, we were all writing about it. And as we're writing about it, talking about it, broadcasting it, the message was consistent. We're going to Ottawa to stay until we get exactly what we want. Now, there were different factions that had different, um, you know, demands. You know, Tamara Litch was mainly about 
and the, the, the cross-border mandates. There were people who had signed that memorandum of understanding wanting to replace the current government with the Senate and the governor general in a committee, you know, but they all said, we're going till we get what we want and what we want is change. And they said that they were staying. I, I don't know how you watch that and come away with, there'll be a one to 2000 people here over the weekend. That was not the message from anyone, but it's the message that Ottawa police wanted to hear. I thought that this was a, a failure of the progressive policing model and view of now former Chief Slowly. I thought, you know, in, and I think still think that's part of it, but it was a failure of intelligence. And yet they were warned. The Ottawa Gatineau uh, Hotel Association said that they'd received inquiries about renting 10,000 rooms or more for 30 to 90 days. Um, and was this feasible? That was shared with city officials. That was shared with the police. One of the councillors uh, sent an email to top city staff saying, look, forget what the police are telling you. These guys are coming for a lot longer than a weekend, and there's going to be a lot more than one to 2,000. They ignored anything that didn't fit with their existing narrative, which was, this will all be over quickly. Don't worry about it. And then, you know, on allowing the trucks in, the chief of police actually had the belief that uh, stopping trucks from going onto Parliament Hill would be a violation of charter rights. It, it absolutely would not be, and no lawyer worth their salt would claim that. If you stop people from walking up to Parliament Hill, absolutely, that would be a violation of charter rights. If you say you can't go protest at Parliament, but protest doesn't include, as I said earlier, having an 18 wheeler with a, a, a you know a, a load on the back parked out in front. That's you know, they're two very different things. So it, complete failure by Ottawa police. That's what we're finding out in the early part of this, long before we'll ever hear from Prime Minister Trudeau or members of his cabinet. Now, there have been a lot of questions about Justice Rouleau, the man appointed to lead the inquiry given his ties to the Liberal Party in the past. Brian, can he really remain objective? In your opinion, has Justice Rouleau said or done anything that maybe shows bias so far? No, not so far. And in fact, his opening statement last week gave me hope um, because I, I have written uh, columns in The Sun saying, look, this we have to keep an eye on this. Justice Rouleau um, in the 1980s, that's how far we're going back. In the 1980s, he was a top staffer to Liberal Prime Minister uh, John Turner. Turner was only briefly Prime Minister, um, but Rouleau was there and then stayed with him when Turner was opposition leader. He was a Liberal donor. But that was in the 1990s. I know there's some um, screen grabs floating around online showing recent donations. That's a different Paul Rouleau. I've spoken to the man. He tells me he's not related to this guy at all, um, but that he is a, a donor to the Liberal Party. So R Justice Rouleau stopped donating in the 90s. He's been a judge with a, a, a good track record since 2002. And he talked about the need to get to the bottom of this, that we needed to find the truth. Uh, he also talked about how there's two mandates. There's the terms of reference that the government gave him, which was, hey, go investigate those truckers. That's what Justin Trudeau wants. But he said there's also the mandate given to him by parliament through the legislation. And that is to investigate, did the government do the right thing? So that gave me a lot of hope that maybe he can put all politics aside and just look for the truth. And that's what we want to find out from this. Was the Emergencies Act required? I've argued from the beginning, even though I think you know, the police should have cleared things out earlier. I never thought that the Emergencies Act was needed. You didn't need to freeze bank accounts. You didn't need to give extraordinary powers. You just had to have a competent police force and police chief in place. And when they got that, things cleared out in Ottawa. So, Brian, let's say all, all 65 people testify. You know, over the next six weeks, Justice Rouleau says, you know what, the Emergencies Act shouldn't have been invoked. The police had a good handle on the situation. Will this put pressure on Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to resign? And he was asked that twice last week, and he dodged it both times. In fact, in, instead, he went on a diatribe about how uh, he did the right thing in invoking the Emergencies Act, and it was a measured response, and that it was time-limited, and he was basically doing a sales pitch, which I think, given the fact that the commission had just started its work, it was the first day, that that was highly inappropriate for him to do. I don't think this is a prime minister that would resign over something like this. We've seen his track record on so many issues that would be the end of other politicians. And he just says, this is a learning experience for all of us. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure what the uh, the outcome of this will be. 
I think it's very much a matter of opinion on whether the Emergencies Act was required. Um, I, I can tell you that if Ottawa police had been competent, there would have been no question about having to invoke it, but they were incompetent. The city leadership was incompetent. The feds did it. I think Justin Trudeau did it for political reasons. I think it was an overreach, uh, but different people have different views, and we'll see what Justice Rouleau comes out with at the end. Brian, the Arrive Can app was heavily criticized by so many Canadians for a number of months. The Trudeau Liberals have made it optional now. Now, we have lots of questions over the cost of the thing, $54 million. Some people are saying it could have been created for under a half a million dollars. It appears as though somebody made a lot of money. Well, it started out apparently as a project for $80,000. And, you know, as happens with so many government projects, things just spiraled out of control from there. But there have been companies who have uh, replicated the Arrive Can app. There are um, people who have said, yes, it could have been done for $250,000 uh, in terms of the time and effort needed to, to pay the coders to do this, to pay for, you know, anything that was needed to, to build this app. Yeah, is uh, Duncan D, the um, uh, former Air Canada executive, who's been very critical of the Trudeau government on travel lately, uh, who's been very active in the media and online, uh, he posted that, look, the, the Arrive Can app costing $54 million is ridiculous. And if you want proof, look at what the airlines did. They added um, the ability to upload your vaccination proof to their check-in so, so that you know you're using their check-in app your WestJet or your Air Canada check-in app, you could add that to your, your check-in um, while you're doing it digitally. It did not cost them $54 million to do that. This should have been a simple thing, as with the case with government, especially government and technology, how every year there is a story that I cover in my long career where it's government cost overruns on technology. This is just the latest embarrassment um, but uh, thankfully, that app is uh, uh, optional now, as they say. You know, there's still plenty of talk about the economy and the impact of inflation from law laws, freezing prices on some goods. Now the House of Commons is voting to investigate what the NDP calls greedflation by food companies. Is there anything the Parliament can really do on the file? Uh, they can grandstand. They can show that they care. They can beat up on... Uh, executives from Loblaws and Metro and Sobeys and, you know, call them all before committee and shame them publicly. This was the NDP's doing. Uh, I understand why everybody else voted for it. When food inflation is at 10%, uh, when every Canadian that goes to the grocery store is noticing the price increase, how do you stand up and say, nah, we don't want to look into that? Uh, you know, Pierre Polyev and the Conservatives have shown that they're going to uh, look at it in a different way. They do want to find out if there's price gouging going on. And look, the food companies have done themselves no favor. Remember the bre bread price fixing scandal from a couple of years ago? So yeah, there's valid reasons to look into this. But Polyev has also signaled that he wants to include the government's role. Will the committee go along with that? I don't know. But I'm sure that they will try and present some evidence that government spending has led to inflation, including food inflation. Um, so, uh, you know, Loblaw is coming out with their price freeze on uh, no-name products just before this vote, uh, probably well-timed uh, PR move, but it's not going to stop them getting hauled before the committee. Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Christian Freeland was joined by a number of bank economists warning of a recession next year. Now, Brian, how bad are things expected to get? Well, at this point, it, it's getting worse, but you know we've been hearing uh, calls for a, a recession going back to June, I think was the first time that the major bank economists said in early 2023, we'll see a recession. Um, I think that the numbers will show that uh, we're in the start of it already when we get the numbers for this current quarter later in the year. Um, it was always described as mild uh, contraction of uh, the economy. I think it'll, you know, it's not going to be horrific. It's not going to be the recessions of the early 1980s or the tech, um, the dot-com bubble bursting or the 2008. I don't think it's going in that way. There's no evidence that it's going that way. But when the finance minister of the country starts talking about it, then you know it's a, going to be a sure thing because they're normally the last people that want to be talking about a recession. The politicians 
are the last to admit, sometimes, like in the United States, they redefine the terms on what a recession is, uh, which you know they've just done because the Americans are technically in one now. And they, I have to say technically because they changed the definitions, uh, but they meet the original, the textbook definition we've been using for, uh, for generations. So the Americans are in one, we're going to go into one, but we're probably looking at about 2% contraction in the economy. That's bad, but it's not devastating. Um, at this point, job growth remains good. And that's what most of us worry about in a recession is, will we get to keep our jobs? Um, how long and how deep this will be, I, I think a good chunk of that's going to come down to the impact of the Bank of Canada raising interest rates, which they're likely going to do in about eight days' time. And yeah, my mortgage is coming up for renewal very soon. Say a prayer for me, will you? Might want to renew early if you can. <laughs> yeah. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you, Hal.